Okay, let's talk about some of the tools you're going to need to get started on doing laptop repairs. First and most basic is just a screwdriver. You could almost get away with doing a whole repair on a laptop with just a screwdriver. That's a Phillips. You should have a Phillips and a straight head. Um, a smart thing to do might be to get a screwdriver kit like this one. This is my favorite one. It's made by a company called Velamin, and I like them because they're super cheap, and the tips of the screwdrivers don't wear out. A lot of cheap screwdrivers do, but this set does not. What does break, however, is the handles, and these two broke in half, but they are actually my favorite two screwdrivers that I use for doing laptop repair. It's that one and that one out of the Velamin case. And you'll see in the videos, these are the screwdrivers I mainly use for uh, taking the laptops apart. Uh, I like that they broke because they fit in your hand easier and they're easier to maneuver. And uh, that's what I use for screwdrivers. Now you could also get precision screwdrivers too. And I bought these at Radio Shack and they're good for getting in the real fine screws. Then you're going to need pliers and wire cutters. Definitely need both of these. I recommend getting for pliers a set like this and with the wire cutters included. You get them at like Home Depot or Lowe's or any hardware store. And these will allow you to get into the more tinier places where mainly that's all you deal with with laptops. You need a small set of tools as well. Definitely need to have a flashlight. Something where if a spot's dark you can see a little bit better. And a soldering iron is crucial. Now this is the soldering iron stand. And that's the soldering iron they use. Just a simple Radio Shack 15 watt soldering iron. Does the job for me. This is the model number. It's a 64-2051B. And the stand, you get that separate or sometimes they come in a combination. Another thing that's really wise to get is a desoldering iron, especially for power jacks. If you got some stingy power jacks that don't want to become disconnected, you use this thing, which is desoldering iron. It's neat, you actually squeeze that little red thing and then you, when you release it, you could suck the solder out through the soldering iron. Or you could use desoldering braid, which is uh, another thing I use in conjunction with the desoldering iron, which seems to work great. This is the solder I use, 6040, 0.032 diameter rosin core solder. I get that at Radio Shack. And that's pretty much my soldering kit right there. Another must is a multimeter. You can find these ranging from like $10 to $100. This is a Radio Shack model. Not my favorite model. The one I use in the videos is my favorite model, which I got at Micro Center for like 10 bucks. So you can find them cheap. And uh, what you just want to have are the basics. I mean, uh, there's not too many features that I would recommend for a uh, multimeter. But one that I do is definitely to make sure it has a, a beep mode where if you set it to test continuity and you touch the two leads together you're going to get a beep because I use that a lot when I do power jack repairs. And next is just to have some wire when you're doing power jack repairs or different types of repairs you get this at any type of store like Radio Shack or order it online. Heat shrink tubing is a must. I use this quite a bit especially when I'm doing power adapter repairs where I have to replace the tip on a power adapter or do any kind of repair on a power adapter. Heat shrink tubing is another place you can get any pretty much anywhere. I get mine at Radio Shack and Micro Center, but you can order it online. Another tool that I feel is a must is helping hands. Helping hands is simply, you know, a base with uh, some alligator clips connected to it and a magnifying glass. It allows you to hold things, providing you basically with another set of hands so you could do some, you know, more difficult tasks like soldering things or uh having things held down that would be normally flapping all around. So helping hands are great for that. Files. Definitely get a small set of files of like tiny files. I use this especially for um, scuffing up a wire or creating uh, contact points on a motherboard. And this picture shows uh, files. Don't get the wrong idea. These are actually miniature files. They're pretty small. You'll see how they look in the videos. Exacto knives. Now, X-Acto knives are something I use fairly frequently, but you never know when you're going to need something really sharp to, to cut something that you're dealing with. And X-Acto knives are small, and they're sharp, and it's a perfect tool to uh, get in there and cut things or shave things that uh, need to be uh, taken care of. And the next thing is glue. Now, this is Elmer's Carpenter's glue. I'm almost using this just for the sake of, of the picture, but I use that very sparingly. The main glues that I actually use are a little bit of Gorilla Glue, but mainly Crazy Glue. Crazy Glue is actually very great for uh, attaching plastic to plastic, and a lot of laptop repairs are just dealing with plastic. 
Um, so definitely recommend Crazy Glue. It's cheap and you can get your hands on that pretty much anywhere as well. When you want something a little more difficult and you need a strong bond, try epoxy. They make a five minute epoxy, which basically dries in five minutes. I recommend letting it sit overnight, but you could technically dry things in five minutes and then they make different bonds of epoxy and we actually have to mix two tubes of material. Uh, and it, it smells pretty strong. You want to be in a ventilated area, but it does provide a strong bond. Haven't used epoxy in a while. Again, my main thing that I use is the crazy glue. Thermal grease. Now, thermal grease is what we use to create a bond between the processor and the heat sink so heat can flow through efficiently and dissipate. And a popular brand of thermal grease is Arctic Silver. And I have a little tube of that, and that's what I use mainly. It gets a little expensive, but you can use pretty much any thermal grease. You'll be okay. Now, you'll see in the later videos exactly how I use the thermal grease, how much I use, and this kind of thing. So uh, stay tuned for that. Okay, now foam. I always use a piece of foam when I'm working on laptops so I don't scratch the top of the laptop when I'm working on it upside down. You can also use it with circuit boards if you don't want like a delicate circuit board to touch the surface that you're working on. I get these foam pieces usually out of desktop motherboard boxes. When I get a motherboard in a, for a desktop, it's usually shipped in a box that has a square piece of foam under it. That's pretty much exactly what I'm using there. Compressed air. Now, if you watch these videos, you're going to see that I use compressed air a lot when I'm working on laptops. I use it to clean out dusty areas on a laptop. I also use it to blow out the CPU fan, get all the chunks of dust out of there. Also, in the heat sink for the CPU, I, I blow air right through the fins of that and clean that all out. Now, the only problem with compressed air is it's expensive. So, if you're going to use a lot of it, I recommend using like a blower on a wet dry vac. And I talk about one that I recommend later in this video. A drill. A drill is a great thing to have if you ever need to drill holes in a laptop case, which I'll show you in a couple of the videos. And get a good set of drill bits that aren't going to uh, flake out on you if possible. I prefer a cordless drill just because it's more easy to, you know, maneuver. It's not too unwieldy, so I use a Black & Decker for that. Screws and hardware. Every time I have some leftover screws or I acquire screws from anywhere that are small and tiny, I collect them. I put them in a small little case store them up because you never know when you're going to need them. now it's nice to have a couple little cases around just to put screws and what rubber pieces and different things that you're going to be doing when we take apart laptops get yourself a tape measure or a ruler or something where you can make measurements or size things up if you need to do that which will definitely happen especially with laptop screens and that sort of thing get yourself a set of tweezers remember you're working in very confined areas um, if you drop a screw or if you need to remove a wire or get into a certain spot and you just can't do it with a pair of needle nose pliers, these are the tools you want to use. I'd buy a whole set of them so you have different varieties so you get in different different areas. And uh, definitely put some tweezers in your toolkit. Allen wrenches. Not terribly commonly used on laptops, but every once in a while you're going to encounter them. So it's probably wise to get a, just a cheap set of Allen wrenches or one of those all-in-one Allen wrench you know, devices that have like six of them or eight of them sticking out like this one here. Paint brushes. I use these paint brushes a lot. I think I got them at Ikea for like $7 for a whole set of them. And I use them to dust off certain parts of the laptop. It's a great thing to use as a duster and you could always shake the dust out of them when you're done. But it's great for laptops because it, it doesn't scratch anything and it gets all the dust out of the little crevices and crannies of the laptop. I love the Stinger 2.5 gallon wet dry vac, which is what this is here. Uh, especially with the brush attachment, it's great for cleaning out keyboards, cleaning up all the dirt off of the top and bottom parts of the case of a computer. Even when you open up the computer, you can use that wet dry vac and suck out a lot of the dust that's on the inside. You'll see how I use it in the videos. Great tool to have in your shop. I definitely recommend it. It's not a necessity, but it's a good idea to have a socket set or something you can unscrew standoffs or bolts or something that's stuck onto a laptop there. And finally, if you look around, you're going to find computer repair kits that have most of the tools I talked about already in them. You get the pliers, the screwdrivers, soldering iron, a small drill in a lot of them, Allen wrenches, X-Acto knives, and tweezers. It is a good thing to have, especially if you're an on-site technician and you need all your tools in one place. So definitely check them out. You can get them at Radio Shack, Micro Center, uh, Newegg. Any big computer store is going to have something like that for you. 
Well, that's going to wrap up the the tools that you need. I went through the basic tools. Some are more necessary than others. As you continue to watch the videos, you'll see what I use the most, and then you'll know you know what priority to get these tools. But that's a quick rundown of pretty much everything I use to get laptop repairs done. Hope it helped. Okay, we're going to talk about batteries in this video. Now, there's all kinds of laptop batteries, and most of the time, they're very specific to the brand that you buy. If you bought an HP, there's only one battery that could fit in there, and you either have to buy an HP or an HP clone. Now, there's not too many things that actually go wrong with batteries, so this is going to be a pretty short video. Let's start by talking about how you can tell if you need to replace a battery or not. Now one way to test this is to go into the power options mode in your computer and you can get to that in Windows through the control panel, power options, and then click on the battery tab and look at what's happening with the battery. It'll tell you if it's charging, if it's not charging, or how much charge is in the battery. Now if the battery is not charging, let's try to rule out some other things first, like it could be a bad power adapter, bad AC adapter. So. If somebody's using an AC adapter that didn't come with that computer, it might not be putting out enough amps or enough wattage to actually charge the battery, and I've seen Dells do this. For example, I've seen power adapters that appear to be correct for Dell computers, but they're a little small actually, and they don't put out the correct amperage. They put out too low of a current, and therefore, though the adapter powers on the Dell computer, it won't charge the battery, and usually you'll get an error message when you boot up with that using that power adapter on a Dell anyway. Now incidentally, you're going to see a lot of AC adapters rated according to wattage. Wattage is simply voltage times the current, or amps. So that formula, V times I, gives you wattage. Let's go through an example here of how you can check if the power adapter is correct for the computer you're working on. We've got a compact laptop here that's not charging. The power adapter is plugged in, and you can see by that lightning bolt it's not charging. Now here's the power adapter we're using. Take note of the second line down there where it says 19 volts green, 4.74 amps max. Now ignore the line above it that says 16 volts. This is a universal power adapter from Kensington and a lot of the universal ones can put out multiple voltage, but the switch on this one we have set for the 19 volts DC and 4.74 amps max. Now we know what this adapter puts out power-wise. Now let's check to see what the correct power adapter is for this compact laptop. And I like to check this on eBay because in the eBay descriptions, it usually tells you what the voltage and the amps are for the power adapter you're trying to buy. Okay, so just go to eBay and do a search for whatever the laptop model is, compact M2000 adapter. It's gonna bring up a long list of results. And we're just going to pick the first one. It looks good. Now we're going to scroll down in this listing and take a look. And we see that this adapter puts out 18.5 volts, 3.5 amps. Okay, let's get a second opinion here. Just go to the next one down and see what voltage and amps this is putting out. And this one, again, is 18.5 volts, 3.5 amps, which equals 65 watts. You'll find if you multiply 18.5 times 3.5, you get 65, and that is that formula I showed you earlier. Now, the reason I checked two vendors is because in case one of them made a mistake and they, they weren't selling the right adapter for the right computer, um, that's why I just checked twice to make sure we're getting the right numbers here. And that's a pretty reliable way of finding out what kind of power adapter that a computer needs just by checking the eBay listings there. Now there's one more thing about power adapters I just want to bring up real quick. The amps on an adapter that you buy, that like for example that one put out 3.5 amps. Power adapters, you could buy one that puts out 100 amps. The amps can be higher than what is required. So that requires 3.5 amps. You could get one that has 6 amps. You could get a power adapter that has 7 amps. You could get one that has 20 amps. And that will still work with that computer. The thing you don't want to be the wrong number is the volts. You can't put a higher voltage power adapter on a computer that's not rated for it. You will fry it. So if you're trying to hook a 25 volt adapter up to a laptop that's supposed to take an 18 volt adapter, bad move, you probably will fry the motherboard. So the volt has to stay the same. If 
a computer needs 18.5 volts, then you need to get an AC adapter that puts out 18.5 volts. You don't want to mess with the volts. But you can go higher on the amps. Okay, now where were we? We were trying to see if the adapter that's being used with this compact computer has enough power and current to power the machine and charge the battery. Now, if you remember looking at the power adapter in an earlier shot, you could see that the voltage is 19 volts and that the amps are at 4.74. Now, this computer only requires 3.5 amps, so 4.74 is higher than 3.5. This adapter does have the capability of powering this machine. Now, I know what I said about volts, and this power adapter says it puts out 19 volts and the computer only takes 18.5, but that's close enough that I'm going to let it slide and that you shouldn't have a problem when it's 0.5 volt that you're going to find out with most adapters 18.5 or 19 are about the same now let's go over the situation where if your DC jack on the laptop is bad and is not making a connection to the motherboard then it might look like the battery is bad as well because the battery is now not holding a charge or even taking a charge now this has happened a lot in my shop with my customers where their DC jack goes bad, they think their battery's gone bad because it's not taking a charge anymore. They go out and buy a new battery, and then they decide to bring their computer in because of the battery's still not charging, even with the new battery. That's because the DC jack is bad. You're going to probably run into this a lot, where um, the battery's not charging because the DC jack is bad, and until you fix that, the battery's never going to charge. So how do you test if your DC jack is bad? It's simple. Plug in the AC adapter, take the battery out of the computer. If the computer doesn't power on, then you know you have a problem with the DC jack. If the computer does power on, you could throw the battery back in and see if it charges. If the battery's not charging at this point, it's pretty likely it's a bad battery. Now it can also be, but it's pretty unlikely that the charging mechanism inside the computer, like on the motherboard, is bad. Now I've done a lot of laptop repairs and I've maybe seen that one time, so I think that's a very rare situation. So it's pretty safe to say right now that the battery is bad. Now let's go over some other reasons why a battery won't be charging. It could possibly be that the contacts between the battery and the motherboard are not making a connection. Maybe something uh, spilled in there or there's some, some film covering the contacts and they're not making a clean connection. One thing you can do is take a toothbrush and just scrub in between the fins of the battery there and also scrub down the fins where the motherboard connection is. Make sure to use a dry toothbrush, preferably one that has not touched human teeth. Now I've also seen instances where there's just some some kind of flukiness that's happening with the computer where if you just take the battery out and you put it back in it might start charging maybe uh there was a malfunction on the motherboard or, or some circuit and it wasn't actually taking a charge try simple things before you just determine that the battery is bad you know reboot the computer power the computer down power it back on take the battery out put it back in once or twice and see what happens just doing that may fix the problem Now, if you've done all the above and you're fairly certain that the battery is bad, it's time to buy a new battery. So I'm going to do a walkthrough here of how I buy a battery for my customers or even for myself and the process that I use to do that. You guessed it, eBay. I loved using eBay to buy specialized parts for laptops that includes batteries, motherboards, screens, and that kind of thing. And here's the process I use to buy batteries on eBay. We're at the home screen of eBay here. The first thing you do is just type in the model number of the computer. This is a compact M2000 and then the word battery. We'll probably get a lot of listings for that. And then a little later I'll show you a different way which might be better. It yielded 645 results. Now that's a lot. When I get that many results I actually like to sort it by price because that's too many to go through one by one so we might as well try to get the cheapest ones first. And I like to order from this country. I'm in the U.S., so I like, I like sellers that ship from the U.S. 
New Jersey is one state away from me, so that might be pretty good. Um, let's click on this and see uh, how good it is. It's a good price, thirty-five ninety. The seller has tons of feedback and a ninety-nine point three feedback rating. I love eBay because of the feedback rating. It's something you can't find at a lot of other places. Some people are afraid and get the wrong idea about eBay, but I actually like eBay because of the feedback rating. Um, what some people aren't thinking with is n- not a lot of websites have feedback ratings, so you could basically – it's easier to get screwed somewhere else, I think, than to get screwed on eBay. Um, the only way you can really get in trouble is if maybe somebody – Overtook uh, Optimum Solution as a username here, his account or something, and stole his account and then was trying to scam, but doesn't really happen often. I buy on eBay all the time. Now, this is a battery for a couple of the models of the Compact Rosario, and M2000 is included in there, so we should be okay. Now, this is a, a fine battery from a third party. This is not HP. So, if you want to stay on the cheap side, you could get a battery like this. If you want to Maybe spend a little bit more but get a higher quality battery. I would actually look for a compact battery and, and made by compact. The way I do that is I search for the word genuine in front of uh, what I typed before before my on my search. And now we only get six. But we now have HP batteries. Now here's a compact a genuine battery M2000. See, the problem with genuine is a lot of times you're not going to find new, especially on the older models. The third party will sell you a new battery. This might be a used, so let's see what's going on with this one. And this is a compact battery. And let's see uh, if they tell us. Okay, it's great cosmetic condition, excellent working condition. Okay, so this is a used. Now, if you really want to get picky and there's not enough listings for us to do this, but say we got another 600 listings typing the word genuine. If you really want to get to cr- the cream of the crop, type new genuine before your search terms and type that. And we're probably going to get nothing out of that. But let's just see. Okay, well, these are some from China. Four results found for new genuine. Okay, this might actually be new. Is this the one we just looked at? Genuine compact battery. And let's see if it is new. Brand new, genuine HP battery. Let's see what the price is. 59 okay? So it's almost twice as much as the third-party no-name battery. But I would consider this. I would consider this. You want to get the brand-name battery. Let's check out the seller. Um, 3,600 feedbacks, 99.7% positive feedback rating in my country, and free shipping. It's not a bad deal. So there's your two options if you want to go cheap, just look for the third-party batteries. If you want to get a more quality battery, try to get an HP or a compact brand-name battery that matches your computer. Now, let's take a look at um, the battery itself that we pulled out of this computer because there's another way to search for this battery, and that's by the model number of the battery. We search from the model number of the computer, but this battery is actually... I'm going to read the model number off now. It's HS... T-N-N-DB-17. Let's type and do a search for that and see what comes up. 135 results for that. And again, since there's that many results, let's sort by price. Okay, it's already sorted by price from last time. Here's a $35 battery. Okay, let's do genuine and see if any come up. Five results for genuine. Decent prices for a genuine, but they look like they're used. And if we type new genuine, again, we're probably going to get almost nothing. There's new genuine. There's only two. One's 52 and one's 78. So that's pretty much where you're going to be ending up. Usually, for almost any battery, you're going to find a 35, 30 bucks will get you a third-party new one. And around between 60 and up to 90, you can get a new genuine one. It's all up to you. If you could swing the genuine one, I recommend the genuine one. If you need to just get by, then third-party one is fine. And that's how I do uh, battery shopping on eBay. This video actually turned out to be longer than I thought. But the last thing I want to talk about now is installing and removing batteries. 
you got your battery, you bought it on eBay or wherever you got it, got delivered, and now it's time to install it or take an old one out. Most laptops have a little slider on the bottom side of the case, usually with a little battery icon next to it. All you do is pull that lever and the battery comes right out. This is how you remove a battery on an older Dell. This old Toshiba has a simple slider, as well as this Sony Vio. Here's a few more with a simple slide switch. Compact Presario, HP DV6000. Now, some have a locking mechanism so the battery doesn't fall out. You're going to see an icon like that. And what you do is you unlock it first, then you hit the slider switch, pull it out, unlock, slide, and pull out. Here's another one. And another one with a locking mechanism. Not very complicated. Then to put it back in, just snaps right back in, no problems. And this one you kind of have to angle in. And there you have it for batteries. CD and DVD drives. A CD or a DVD drive could go bad in a laptop and needs to be replaced. Some of the symptoms of a bad drive could be, number one, that it's loud. Now this could be when a disc is in or a disc is not in. Maybe there's a grinding sound. I've seen drives where when you put a disc in, maybe the spindle's loose or something's not grabbing, and it just kind of flings the CD around on the inside and makes a really loud noise that could scratch your CD. Another symptom could be that the computer won't read the disc. When you put a disc in, it might not show up in Windows or even any operating system. And third is that the system doesn't recognize the drive at all. This is either in the BIOS or in a device manager, or it might show up as an error in a device manager. I'm sure you've seen those yellow question mark and yellow exclamation marks in the device manager for certain devices that are malfunctioning. You could check for that as well on a CD or DVD drive. Now when you're checking in a device manager, don't make the mistake of thinking it's a hardware problem when it might be a software problem. I've seen CD and DVD drives that don't show up when you click the My Computer icon, but it's due to like a conflict with iTunes or something like that, in which case you have to go into the registry and delete a key called the upper and lower filters, which we're not going to get into here. This is more hardware based, but uh, it still could be that the device manager's not showing the drive, but there's nothing actually wrong with the CD DVD, DVD drive. So check that out too. Now let's go over how you remove a drive from a laptop. It's really easy. CD and DVD drives are one of the easier things to work on on a laptop. And you're usually going to see an icon on the underside of the computer with a little disk type picture on it, like you see here. And next to that picture is usually a screw or a hole for a screw. And CD and DVD drives, for the most part, usually come out with that one screw. What you do is you unscrew that screw, pull that screw out, and then you grab the front of the CD DVD drive and just pull it out. And here's an example using another computer. This is a Dell laptop I have here. Now sometimes there's more than one screw holding these drives in or that there's only one screw but it's hidden like under the keyboard or in a different location on the computer. And this is mostly the case in older computers but you never know depending on a certain brand where the screw to get the CD drive is. You just gotta search for it. Now let's take a look at the drive after we get it out. DVD drives and CD drives may look very different from model to model on computers, but they're pretty much the same. They're just um, covered in a, a case usually or have a different front plate on them or a different back fastener. Now if you look here, you'll see what I'm talking about. The front plate on a CD drive comes off and leaves pretty much a standard drive that could be used in pretty much any laptop. But don't go ahead thinking you could put this drive in any laptop because though they look the same, the front plates are not universal. In other words, the front plates have connectors on them that connect to the front of that CD drive, but they're different from model to model. So you're going to find if you try to mix and match those front plates, it may work with some drives, it may not work with other drives. So you can't just go ahead and buy any drive you want and, and put it in that computer. You're going to need one that's compatible with the front plate on that drive. 
The other thing that's different from drive to drive is this rear fastener. And this is where the screw that holds the CD drive in the computer, this is where the screw gets fastened onto. Now this little piece of metal actually screws into the back of the CD drive and the screw that holds the CD drive in the computer screws down into that fastener. But when you take the fastener and the front plate off, CD drives are going to look, for the most part, identical from model to model. Now the new thing is slot-loaded CD and DVD drives. Now it's not really a new thing for Apple, you're going to see most Apples have a slot-loaded drive, but more high-end laptops and some of the newer models, even sometimes some of the thinner netbook type models, have a slot-loaded CD and DVD drive, which you see here. Now for me, it's worth it if a drive breaks to replace the drive. If you want to get fancy, you could technically take them apart. And I do recommend, actually, at least once in your life, take apart a CD, DVD drive and see what the insides look like and see how it works. You're going to find that there's a ribbon and there's rails that it slides around. There's a ribbon cable and, and, different and the laser and different parts in there you could check out and just get an idea of what's actually on the inside. But when you get down to that level, I think it's a little too fine to actually go in and do some repairs. If you can do it, more power to you. That's great. But drives are so cheap now that I just buy a new drive if I have a failing drive. The only thing I really do to repair a drive or attempt to repair it is blow out the drive with compressed air. Sometimes the drive is just simply dirty. And if you could clean it up a little bit and get out maybe some chunks that are blocking the drive or covering the laser or causing a malfunction, you could get a working drive out of that. Let's take the compact computer that we looked at earlier before and see how we would go about ordering a replacement drive for that. I'm going to show you the process that I use. The first thing I do is get the model number of the drive we're trying to replace. This one is CRX835E, which you can see by the arrow up there. Now the place I like to buy my drives is on eBay. So the first thing we do is type in the model number CRX835E into eBay. Now that model number is obscure enough that we can just type that and that only will probably get uh, search results just for that CD drive and we do. So we got 19 results here different varieties. Um, of course, I'm going to sort them by price first. Now, if they want to use one, I'm going to keep the search results as they are, just sort it by price. Look for the cheapest one that's sold from my country. Uh, here's one sold from Texas. And they have good feedback, 100%. They only have 181 feedbacks, which is, in eBay, it's not the greatest. You want somebody that has sold thousands if you really want to be safe. Let's try the first one on the list. They're from New Jersey. And they've sold 405 items. They have 100, so that's a little bit better. Um, $25 is the price. And let's see. Its item is in work, working perfect condition. It was pulled from a 100% working HP laptop. Okay, that's fine. So the item condition is used. Now, if we really wanted to uh, get a search result a little more narrow and try to find a new one, let's just type the word new in there. See what comes up. Only one result found for new. And two items found in eBay stores. I've bought from eBay stores as well. They're fine. And this is in Taiwan, the new one. So I don't like buying from another country just because it takes too long to get here and the shipping is more expensive. So I'm probably going to stick with a used one like I looked at before. So anyway... And we'll probably buy the one there from New Jersey, the first one back in here. And that looks like a good deal. Now I'll just end off this movie by showing you a series of clips of me taking drives out of different laptops. Just to give you an idea of the variety of ways it can be taken out and uh, just the methods that used to get that done. Now this compact is one of the ones I was talking about earlier where it's a little bit of an older machine. You actually have to get under the keyboard to get the CD drive out. And to get onto the keyboard, you first have to take off this plate that sits above the keyboard. I unscrewed two screws from the back a little bit earlier. And with those screws out, now I can just pry it up. It's easy to pry from getting under the hinge covers with like a flathead screwdriver. That's how you get that plate off pretty easy. Then we've got to take off four screws above the keyboard, get the keyboard off, and then we have access to the CD drive. Now, in more recent years, they changed the design of most laptops to make it easier to access the CD drive, but this is how you did it 
when this computer was made, which is probably around 2003, 2002 perhaps. Now you just flip up the keyboard, you can leave it attached, and it exposes the two holes where you have to put the screwdriver in to get those screws out, and then the CD drive will come out after that. There's one. There's a second one. Push a drive from the inside, pops out, and there you go. Now another laptop I'm not a big fan of because they get a little bit intricate is the Sony Vios. And for this one, which is also an older model one, you got to get under the hard drive to get the CD drive out. So you take the hard drive cover off, then you got to take the four screws off that hold the hard drive in. There's the tiny screws. Can't really see it in the camera. You pull the hard drive out. It slides out and pops up, which exposes two screws there and there that you need to unscrew to get the CD drive out. There's one. There's the other. Now there's nowhere to push the drive out from the inside really, so we're gonna take our paper clip, put it in the drive hole there, open up the drive, and then pull it out that way. This is a pretty simple one. This is just an HP DV6000. The one screw, like we talked about earlier, pops right out. And here we have a Toshiba gaming machine. Another, another one where you just take one screw, because this is a newer model computer. One screw, pull the drive out, this one actually happens to be an HD DVD drive. Well, thanks for watching this video. Hope you got something out of it. Okay, it's time to talk about motherboards. Now, I get the impression that motherboards scare a lot of people in this field. You know, people don't want to deal with them or replace them or try to fix them. Or, or it's a little daunting to uh, try to diagnose a motherboard. It might seem. But what I'm going to tell you is it's pretty easy. There's four main symptoms that could go wrong with a motherboard and they are one the laptop won't power on two components in the laptop are not working malfunctioning three the computer shuts down randomly four the computer acts abnormally now we're going to go through these symptoms one by one there could be more symptoms but these are the ones that i found in my experiences now number one computer won't power on you got a laptop that doesn't power on, how can you tell if the motherboard is bad? Well, you just ask yourself, why else wouldn't a computer power on? Number one, if it's on battery power, the battery's dead or the battery's bad. And number two, the AC adapter could be bad. So let's rule out number one, pull the battery out, keep the battery out of the computer for this test. And then take your AC adapter and check the voltage with a voltmeter. And I'm gonna show you how to do that right here. You just use a regular voltmeter. And what you want to test for is voltage. I'm going to put the meter at 20 volts. And you take the tip, the power, the power jack tip. You hold your black, your negative on the outside of the tip. And you put the red the, um, on the in, in the hole on the inside of the tip. Be very careful not to touch the red and the black and the tips together, otherwise it will create a short circuit. Now you can't see it probably on that video. Oh, there you can. 19 volts, just about 19 volts. So we know the power adapter works. Now just to make sure, you could take the power adapter and kind of bend it around a little bit and make sure that it's making a good connection. Let's see, I'm gonna do that right now. Okay, I'm still getting Still getting 19 volts, and I'm moving the power adapter around a little bit, jiggling it around, making sure that there's no crimps in the wire. Okay, even though I jiggle it around, it's still moving around at 19 volts. So we know the tip is good. A lot of times, you know, the tip will break like right in this area here, and you won't get that 19 volts after you do that, after it's broken. So instead of just taking the whole computer apart and finding out it has a perfectly good power jack, Test the power adapter first. 
Now, another reason a motherboard might not turn on is because it's not getting power through the power jack. The power jack might be damaged. So observe what you can from the outside and see if you can see if the power jack's loose or detached from the motherboard. And if it is, then you know you have to replace the power jack probably. But if it looks like it's secure, the only way we're going to be able to test the power jack is to get down to motherboard level and look at where the power jack is soldered onto the motherboard. And this I cover in many of the case study videos. Now there's a few other things that might cause a motherboard not to turn on or a computer not to turn on. It could have a bad processor, but bad processors are fairly rare. I would say one out of every 75 computers I work on, it's the processor rather than the motherboard that's bad. And also there's like maybe the power button on the actual laptop is broken or something mechanical like that. But again, that's unlikely, but you could check those things too. Okay, number two, components in the laptop won't work. For example, a CD drive or a wireless card don't, don't show up in Windows or they're not working properly. Well, that could possibly be a motherboard, but the way to test that is to replace that component. If your CD drive is not working, replace the CD drive. If it's still not working, maybe the CD drive controller on the motherboard is bad. I've had that happen on a couple Toshiba laptops I worked on. I bought a brand new CD drive, put them in, it's still not working, still wasn't recognized by the BIOS, and it was a bad motherboard. Now HP also had a problem with their wireless cards. But it wasn't the wireless cards that were bad. It was the actual controller on the motherboard that controls the card that was bad. I think it was positioned next to a chip that got real hot, like the graphics chip or something like that on the motherboard. So if you have a laptop with components not working and you replace the components and they're still not working, then you might have a bad motherboard. Now, how do you rule out if Windows isn't causing this problem or the operating system is not causing a problem? Well, test it with a different operating system. This is always a good test of a motherboard using like a Linux, Linux distribution like Nopix or using the Ultimate Boot CD for Windows. These are both bootable CDs and it's essentially testing the hardware of the laptop because you're running it on a different operating system. Last thing to try if components aren't working and you suspect it's your motherboard, flash the BIOS of the motherboard. Maybe the BIOS got corrupted somehow, and since the BIOS is like handles the basic functions of a computer, maybe it's not doing its job and causing some abnormal activity in the computer. Okay, number three, computer shuts down randomly. Now this is a common symptom of a computer overheating. So let's make sure it's not an overheating problem. And how do we do that? Well, what I do is I take a can of compressed air and I blow it into the laptop in the bottom where the fan is and also in the heat sink on the side of the computer. If you do this, you might see clouds of dust come out and that's a good thing, but you wanna make sure you get all the chunks out of the laptop before you turn it back on because those chunks of dust that might still be stuck in there might cause the fan blades to actually stick. I go over this in the case study videos and several of them. Watch how I do that there and you can see in action, you know, cleaning out a laptop and getting all the dust out of it. Now once you get the dust out of a laptop and you're sure that the fan is spinning and the airways are clean, if the computer keeps shutting down after this, you can be pretty certain that it's not the CPU overheating that's causing the problem, but a problem with the motherboard. I've had systems where I opened them up, I made sure all the airways were clean, I made sure that the heatsink was making a good connection with the processor, put it all back together, and the computer still powered down. It turned out it was a bad motherboard. Okay, number four, the computer acts abnormally. It blue screens, things aren't working the way they're supposed to, it doesn't boot up every time, it doesn't boot up at all sometimes. Now first I want to make sure it's not Windows that's causing a problem, so again, we're not going to deal too much with the software side, so do all your Windows fixes and make sure that Windows isn't causing a problem. Or like I said before, just run Nopix, which is a great Linux distribution, the Ultimate Boot CD for Windows, which is also great, and then you'll know Windows isn't the thing that's causing the problem. Then if you're still having problems with the computer acting abnormally, start taking out components one by one. Take the hard drive out. You could do that if you're running it from a uh, live Linux distribution. Um, take the RAM out. Replace the RAM, maybe with a stick of RAM that you know is good that you have around in the shop. Take the wireless card out. Take the CD drive out. And start taking components out one by one and get the motherboard down to 
basics like CPU, one stick of RAM, motherboard, and power. And hook up the screen and just make sure that it goes on. But break it down to basics so you're sure that it's not a component that's causing the problem. So once you have it all broken down to basics and you're sure Windows isn't causing a problem, then it's probably a bad motherboard. Okay, so it's a bad motherboard. Now you need to buy a motherboard. Where do I buy my motherboards? You guessed it, on eBay. Uh, I love buying on eBay because you got a great selection. You can buy from multiple sellers and you usually get the best price. Now the way to search on eBay for a motherboard is first try to get the model number off of the motherboard itself if you can. If you have access to the motherboard you already or you already took the computer apart, get the model off the motherboard and do a search for that motherboard. If you're not at that point and you still need to order the motherboard, you could type in the model number of the computer you got the motherboard out of and do a search that way like let's say if it's um, a Compaq M2000 just type you know in eBay Compaq M2000 motherboard and do a search like that. The problem with doing a search like that though is for example HP's have like a DV6000 model but there's actually like a hundred different sub models in the DV6000 series and some of them have different motherboards than each other like say there's a DV6310 US or DV6425 so that's when you have a computer like that it's a little dangerous to search for a motherboard just by model number of the computer alone I've gotten burned on that many times myself and so it's best just to pull the motherboard out and look on the motherboard and get the model off the motherboard and do a search to buy one using the model number of the motherboard. Now that leads to the next question. How do you get the motherboard out? Well, that's what all the case study videos show you. A lot of them involve bringing the laptop down the motherboard level when we're doing a repair. But before you watch the case study videos, make sure you watch the video on how to take a laptop apart, get the basics, then watch the case study videos, and then you can attempt it yourself.